Welcome to Retirement Mentorship. My name is Freeman. I am your host. Cyrus asks, can you beat the S&P 500? Specifically, he references how Dave Ramsey is often said on a show, it's easy to find funds that outperform the S&P 500. Is this true? And if it's so easy, why doesn't everyone do it? I did provide an answer sort of to this three years ago in episode eight, how to be above average. Um, however, that episode's kind of long and there's plenty more to say about it. And, and so if this topic is interesting to you, you can go back and, and listen to that one. You can scroll all the way back through your podcast, way back to 2021 to find that or retirementorship.com slash eight, and that'll take you right to it. Um, and so we, and we just discussed the flip side of this last week, right? Uh, what if my performance is worse than the S&P 500? So you can check that out if you missed last week. And again, if you have questions like this, you can always submit them to us at questions at retirementorship.com or retirementorship.com slash question. And so again, let's look at this, right? Is it easy to beat the S&P 500? And I don't know how often Dave Ramsey says this, right? Presumably Cyrus heard it recently, which prompted the question. And though I don't listen to Dave Ramsey regularly anymore, I, I do remember him saying it several times when I was a regular listener, right? And it's that something along the lines of it is that it is easy to find funds that outperform the S&P 500. So let me make a crystal clear distinction here, right? There is a world of difference between funds that have outperformed and the S&P 500 past tense and those that outperform the S&P 500 present progressive. Right? Are we talking about outperforming in the future or outperformed in the past? Because you're right. It is easy to find funds that have outperformed the S&P. However, there is no evidence for the persistence of performance. Those funds that have outperformed in the past have done so for two reasons. Uh, number one, outperformance within a period. Uh, it's incredibly easy to find funds that have outperformed anything over a select period. If you compare one, three, five, or even 10 year periods, you can find funds that have done way better. It's it is very easy to find funds that have outperformed. The shorter the time frame, the easier it is to find better funds. Often, if you extend or shorten the time frame, you'll see that they haven't done better. And so, so what do I mean, right? So let's say you extend the period. You're looking at some period of time and you just extend it. Let's say that you find a fund that uh, it's been outperforming the S&P 500 over all of the last one, three, and five year periods, right? Great, you think. Here's one of those outperforming funds. Here's one of those e funds that are easy to find that outperform the S&P 500. But then you look at the 10-year period and it's underperforming over the last 10 years. So what does that tell you? Has this fund found the, the magical formula in the last five years to outperformance in the future? Or have they just gotten lucky recently? Right? We do not care what the fund did in the past. We only care what it'll do in the future. And will the fund outperform or will will you know going, going forward then, right? Will this fund perform like its five-year performance or like its 10-year performance? And there's no way to know. Right? Just because it's done, been doing, doing well recently, especially if it's got a, hit, a longer history of doing poorly, which, which of those is going to win out in the future? We don't know. There's no way to know. Or if you shorten the period, right? Maybe you find a fund that has outperformed over the last 10 years and, and the since inception dates. Awesome. We found one of those funds that Dave Ramsey talks about all the time. And you know you're not just looking at recent performance, right? You're like, I don't look at recent performance. Freeman says to look at the long-term performance. That, that, that performance should be measured in decades, not years. And so you're looking at long-term performance. And over the last 10 years, since inception, it's outperformed. And you're like, great, here's, here's one of those. It's outperformed over the long term. But then you notice that each of its one, three, and five-year performance is below the S&P 500. Lately, it is consistently underperforming the market. How? Well, here's the thing, right? This fund could have easily gotten lucky in the early years, creating such an initial performance that, that the initial luck kept keeps looking good, right? It did so well at the beginning that looking over long periods of time, it's still outperforming. But recently, it's underperforming because they actually don't know what they're doing. They don't have any of that initial luck that they originally had. Right? There's, there's a survival bias of this. And we talked about this 
um, in episode eight in more detail, but I'll just touch on it now. Go back and listen to that if you want to find it, that that when they release investments to the, the, the public, they might release 10 new funds all at once. And nine of them severely outperform the market and they're just closed down. They just shut them down. And one gets lucky and outperforms. And that initial luck covers over a multitude of investing failures in the future. But that, that initial luck helps it look like it's still outperforming and, and you think it's going to be a great outperformer going forward. And that's not the case. It just got lucky and it's the lone survivor from a whole bunch of unlucky failures. And that's why past performance does not indicate future success, right? Past performance does not guarantee future success. That, that, that disclaimer is on all investments, right? Past performance does not guarantee future performance. In most key, cases, it doesn't even indicate future performance. There is no evidence for the persistence of performance. So here's the thing, right? Dave Ramsey is wrong. Uh, episodes nine and 10 is Dave Ramsey wrong, uh, cover a lot of Dave's controversial statements, some of which I agree with, others of which I don't. Um, and we can add this to the list of wrong statements that we covered back then. It is not easy to find these funds. Right? While it's easy to find funds that had better past performance, it's impossible to find funds that outperform the S&P 500 in the future because there's no facts about the future. We don't know that any of these funds will do better than the S&P 500 in the future. It's just, that's, just, that's just an incorrect statement. Again, right? It, it makes sense. If these funds were so easy to find, everyone would find them. Everyone would be outperforming the S&P 500. Everyone would be above average, which of course is not possible. Can you beat the S&P 500? So it's not easy, but is it possible? Yes, maybe. Okay, it depends. Which is like the worst answer of all time. It's the lawyer answer. Oh, it depends. So what does it depend on? Okay. There are periods when funds, when, when funds other than uh, equity index have outperformed. Um, it's, so, you know, there have been periods where certain things have done better than the S&P 500 in the past. And so it's logical to assume that in the future, other equity indexes, other funds will also outperform. The problem is there's no way to know which funds or indexes will outperform in the future, right? So it depends on two things. One, it depends on the index. Uh, you know, so the S&P 500 index or list is of the 500 largest companies in the US, but it's not the only index. There are many other indexes and classes of companies that also perform well. The biggest companies in the US have some advantages regarding their continued growth and pro uh, profitability, right? They got some economies of scales and these other things. Um, they didn't get there by being stupid. Right? It's reasonable to assume that these companies that reach the status of being one of the 500 largest companies will continue to be profitable and grow. And thus, these are great companies. This is a great list of companies to co-own, to be invested in, to be stock ownership, and to, you know, to have in your portfolio. Um, but in some ways, buying the S&P is buying high. Right? Think about it. These, you're buying companies only after they've become big. Every company that, that is on that list started small and had tremendous growth to reach that status. And so if you're waiting to buy your companies until they're already the largest companies in the world, then you're buying at the top in some way, right? They may keep going. It's not a reason not to own the S&P 500 or companies listed there, but you are certainly missing out on a lot of growth along the way that helped them get to that point. And so there are other indexes out there, notably small cap indexes and mid cap indexes. And every S&P 500 company that's on the list right now was part of a small cap index and then a mid cap index until they outgrew both of those and joined the large ones, right? Wouldn't you have liked to have owned Amazon or Apple before they reached the behemoth status they are now? Yeah, we would. And if you own small cap and mid cap indexes all the way along the line, you did. You own those companies from when they were small all the way through to when they were large. They were just moving indexes along the way. And that's why it's great to have all those indexes because you're, you're covering companies all the way through the spectrum, right? Now, not all small companies make it to the S&P 500. It's not like a guaranteed thing. I'll just buy the small indexes and they'll all grow and become the larger. No, it's obviously not how that works. But each company that is in the 500 started small. So just diversifying out of large companies allow you to harness that growth. And many indexes have outperformed uh, the S&P 500 over s different time periods, right? And, and others haven't come close, right? So, so it depends on the index. What index are you following? Some indexes have always been bad. So we don't 
There's no reason to buy into those indexes because they have no track record of ever being better. You want to find other indexes that have done better than the S&P 500 at some point, right? Fairly consistent. So it depends on the index. And number two, depends on the period, right? The period you measure your returns off of dramatically impacts the results that you get. Let's look at some examples of large cap and small cap index returns, right? Um, so all these numbers are as of December 31st in the year we're talking about. So 10-year returns uh, ending 2023, right? December 31st, 2023. So during that period, during the last 10 years ending 2023, large cap companies did 11.8%, right? 11.8. Small cap did 8.3. That's a big difference, right? That's a it's a eight and a half or four and a half percent difference on that. And over 10 years, that's a big difference in your returns, right? So large cap is a better investment, right? Well, what about the period before? What if we just move it back 10 years? So the 10 year period ending 2013. Well, during that period, large cap did 7.3% and small cap did 10.2%. So it's, it's the other way. It's a 3% difference, the opposite direction. So maybe not, right? Maybe there's a you know, there's a similar spread either way. It just depends on the on the period you're looking at. Who's who's got the edge? Well, let's look at both periods and let's you know just tack them one on top of each other. So the 20 year returns ending 2023, at covering both of those periods, large caps did 9.56 and small caps did 9.25. Really close, right? A large cap large cap has a slight edge, right? Buying the big companies has a slight edge over that 20 year period. But what if we back it up just one year? So instead of ending 2023, it ends 2022. Well, in that case, large cap did 9.66. Small cap did 10.40. So wait, who's got the edge? Which one's better? It depends on the period. If you shift just one year, it changes the lead. If you shift to 10 years, it changes who has the lead, right? So these indexes both do really well. It just depends on the period that we're measuring, which one is better. And so if you see... Similar differences, right? And you, and you can you can see similar differences if you use 15-year periods or 30-year periods or 19-year periods or, and many more. Whatever period you're using, it's going to have a massive impact on those results, All right? So there's no evidence for the persistence of performance. We keep coming back to this, right? Because large cap funds, right? Especially large cap growth funds have done really, really well over the last 10 years. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they will over the next 10 we could be looking at, at a, a period of underperformance over the next 10 just to even it back out. Small cap had a 3% surplus on large cap 10 years ago and then proceeded to underperform by 3% the next 10, right? Will large cap continue to be the best or maybe they're going to underperform and, and come back down to earth? No one knows. No one knows. Again, you can, no, so, so again, I feel like I keep avoiding the question, right? Can you beat the S&P 500 or not? And so for the 10 years we discussed, right, anyone investing in small cap index funds beat the S&P 500 for that 10 year period ending in 2013. That's one example, right? There are numerous examples of other periods where other indexes beat the S&P 500 and other periods where the S&P 500 beat everything else. And so what we want to do is we want to use a strategy that gives us the best chance. There's a strategy, right? And it gives us the best chance of, of outperformance. Unfortunately, for a general audience like this, I cannot tell you what it is because way gets way too much into investment advice and I'm legally not allowed to give investment advice to the general public. If you're a client of mine, we're already doing this, All right? So if you're wondering like, oh, if you're a client, you're listening to this and you're like, oh, what is this? What is this strategy that he's talking about that that, that might be under overperforming? Um, we're already doing it. And so I'd be happy to give you a refresher on what that strategy is at any point, right? We talked about it when we launched into it originally. If you've been a client for a long time, you may have forgotten. And we let's brush up on that. Um, and, uh, you know, it only, if you, especially if you've already listened to this, it should only take you a few minutes for me to, to catch you up on, on the rest of that. Um, if you're not a client of mine, then I explain the basics of this strategy uh, during our 3D evaluation process, right? It's a couple of free meetings where we get to know each other and see if we should work together. And that process ends with you sleeping on it and considering it and talking to other people if you want before you decide whether or not you want to work with us. So it's a very, it's a very low pressure, no pressure situation. So if you want to learn what the strategy is, you can go through those two meetings, see the strategy, see other ways we can help you, and maybe we can get you to a better place. That's all with my my actual investment planning, financial planning firm, Lacrosse Financial Planning. You can find links to all that. Um, in the show notes for this episode, which is episode 158. 
So go to retirementorship.com slash 158 and you'll go to the notes here. There's a bunch of hyperlinks in there and you can find all this stuff. So hopefully that helps. Can you beat the S&P 500? Yes, we can. It's been done in the past. There's mathematical ways to hopefully do it in the future. There's no way to guarantee it, um, but certainly ways that give us the best chance. Hopefully that's been at least somewhat helpful. We'll see you next week. Cheers. If you enjoyed that, you would love being part of our free membership community. It's called Retire Membership, and it has a host of benefits all for free. For example, you can always buy my book, 3D Retirement Income, on Amazon. But if you join us at Retire Membership, we will send you either a hard copy or paperback for free, provide the ebook and the audiobook so that you can listen to it if you don't have time to read it. In addition to that, we'll also provide you with a bunch of content that you can't get anywhere else. For example, we have our quarterly retire mentorship magazine, which comes out quarterly and has no ads whatsoever. It's just timely content to help you stay the course. We also have workbooks for our free online workshop to help you get the most out of those, flow charts to help you make better decisions, and a weekly email to provide timely content that you can unsubscribe from at any time. We never ask for any payment information and we never share your information with anyone else. We just want to provide timely content and help you stay the course to retire successfully and stay successfully retired. There's no reason to wait. So join us now at retiremembership.com where you can click in the link in the description and it'll go right there. We can't wait to see you in the community. Cheers.